So we've been asked today to present on positioning for dysphagia and what we might bring to that, that picture when we're talking about people who are having difficulty with their swallow. So firstly, I just wanted to explain a little bit about who we are and the context of, um, that we come from and what experience we've had to be able to provide some of this information to you today. So we're part of the clinical practice support team within ADAC and our team works across Sydney, South East Sydney and South West Sydney districts. And we provide clinical support and consultation to therapists within the disability sector. So that includes both the therapists within ADAC, but also therapists um, with, who work in an NGO or a private practice. Um, so our team's made up of OTs and physios. We also have a speech pathologist, a clinical nurse consultant, a senior specialist psychologist, and a senior practitioner. And so our knowledge and skills are based around an ADAC client profile. Um, so that's a client with a, an intellectual disability primarily, but obviously most of them have some sort of other diagnosis on top of that. So they might have cerebral palsy or autism or a syndrome or some sort of genetic disorder. So that's where our, pres our expertise has come from. So our presentation is foc focused around those types of clients. And we also work um, in teams, so it's, it's also based on, I guess, the ability to have other disciplines and other expertise at our fingertips. So we work across the lifespan, and we've tried to consider a range of ages in this presentation, but we haven't covered infants. So infants require um, a different type of positioning support, and so we haven't covered that today. Um, we also want to acknowledge the wealth of knowledge that is in this room. Um, and that you may be regularly working with OTs and physios and for you some of this information you probably already know and it's embedded into your practice and for others hopefully we'll be able to give you a bit of an idea about what working with an OT and a physio in this way might look like and what some of the things that um, we can work together on. Um, so I also want to acknowledge that all of the photos we've used are from Google Images so they're not pictures of actual clients. So we're going to start with an activity and this is really embarrassing <laughs> and I had no idea till I took these photos how many double chins I end up in my profile. But anyway, um, so what we'd like you to do is just take a few minutes and we want you to circle the picture that you think best represents chin tuck. So you can discuss it in your tables if you'd like um, but we'll just take a few minutes. So we want chin tuck and then thank goodness we're collecting these sheets so you don't get to take them off. <laughs> So to give you a bit of an idea about what we're going to cover today. So firstly, we're going to talk about the goals and positioning of mealtimes and what the different disciplines might bring to that goal. Well, Margaret will then be doing a little bit of a literature review to have a look at um, what literature is out there and how that might inform our practice. We'll then be going through what the guiding principles we might um, bring to um, the client and when we're positioning them. So what we're, we're considering from our point of view. We'll then have some case studies. So we've got three case studies we're going to be discussing. One who's a client who needs fairly minimal support, another client who's in the more moderate range of their positioning needs, and then somebody who has high support needs. Um, and then we'll go through a bit of a wrap-up and some key messages, and we'll hopefully have some time for questions at the end. So goals for positioning and mealtime, and I know sometimes we can get a little bit bogged down in, in goals and wording of goals and how many goals we should use, um, but I guess in this case we want to focus on our goal is about reducing risk. It's about reducing risk of the client aspirating and choking on their food. And I think all the clinicians coming to the table for that client um, need to keep that in the forefront of their mind because there are obviously lots of other things that will impact on how on the strategies we might suggest or how we might approach that client. Um, but I think we all need to be on the same page that our, our aim is about reducing risk. And, but we also need to, of course, consider the bigger context of meal times. And so we can't actually separate the act of eating and swallowing from the activity of the bigger meal time. And so that's where the OT can be really valuable. So I think our expertise comes to bring the holistic view into the picture and having a look at what is happening for the client before and during and after that meal time and bringing that all together. So our, the OT philosophy tends to be based around participation and function. And so when we're looking at a meal time, we might consider how it fits into the routine. So what's happened before that meal but, um, to to impact on that person's participation at the meal time. 
So perhaps they've just finished a community outing or the child's at a school and they've just had to walk back from library and they're coming to the milk time quite tired and fatigued. So um, we might, or they might have been out of their wheelchair in the classroom and they've had to put them back in the wheelchair to bring them to lunch and that's made the child quite agitated and annoyed because they actually don't like being in their wheelchair. So we need to consider some of those, those other factors when we're assessing what this child needs in terms of their positioning. We might also look at their fine motor skills and we might prescribe some equipment like some cutlery or some plates around that. Um, we might also look at what the client's sensory preferences are. So look at their arousal levels and how we might be able to match the arousal level that we need for them to engage in their meal time. So I guess we try to pull all of that information together in the context of the child to be able to participate and function as independently as possible. So physiotherapists come from a background and a, a framework of body structures and function. So their expertise is in postural alignment, it's in muscle, muscle efficiency and strength of muscles. So they'll look at how the bones and the muscles might work together to create movement. And they'll also look at respiratory function and the overall health of the client. So they'll be looking at how the person's sitting, what their alignment might look like to make sure their movement is effective. And they also um, might assess if that person can maintain that position. How long might they be able to sit there the way that we would like them to? So um, if, if fatigue is a problem, they might provide some strategies to help build that endurance for, for the person to be able to use those postural muscles to sit for the length of the meal time. So they might also consider how their posture affects their respiration and how that works with your swallowing and your breathing and what those physical impairments might look like that are affecting their posture and their overall health. So of course there might also be a dietitian involved as part of the team and you as a speech pathologist play a really key role obviously. And we all come from different frameworks, different philosophies, different clinical backgrounds to be able to look at this one picture and create the best outcome for, them, for the client. So we all need to come together to bring our own views, our own um, background clinical knowledge to be able to pull it all together to make sense. <coughs> so we also then, of course, have a purpose around the mealtime. So we have an overall goal to reduce that risk. But then we also need to consider what the purpose of that mealtime might be. So and this will help with your clinical reasoning and it also might help to determine which clinicians we might need in this picture. Do we need the speechy? Do, well, we obviously need the speechy. Do we need the OT? Do we need the physiotherapist? Do we need the dietitian? Who, how are we going to complete this picture? So the purpose of the mealtime could simply be nutrition and making sure that the adequate volume of food is induced during that mealtime. So in terms of positioning, that means that we might consider the trunk posture for digestion. We want to make sure that we can align that, post that trunk as best we can. We might also look at um, getting the optimal head and neck position. So how can we get the best possible position um, using all of our knowledge to make sure that they're a safe swallow, we reduce that risk as much as we can. So we'd obviously be relying on the speech pathologist to educate us on what that head and neck position might look like for that specific client. We might also consider, well, if this person is a slow eater, how long will they be sitting for this meal time and can their muscles actually maintain the position we've chosen for the full length to be able to get enough nutrition that they need for that particular meal time. So we might be using equipment or we might be setting up using gravity to help maintain that person's posture for the whole meal time. So the purpose of the mealtime might also focus more around the social interaction, enjoyment, the family time around a meal. So for those kind of clients, we might look at um, the table and the chair. How do they fit together? If the client's in a wheelchair, can we even get them to the table? Because a lot of the time they sit fairly high, they've got all of this stuff underneath them, and we can't actually get this person to the table. Or we've got them back in tilt so they have no eyesight or well, their eyesight is slightly high and they can't see and interact with the people around them. So we might look at how all of that fits together and what we can modify to make sure that the purpose of that mealtime, the social interaction is, um, and the, the family time is met. So we might also consider if it's about enjoyment, can they reach the food on the table? Do they have the skills or do we need to support them? Can they actually make choices around what they're eating. 
So we want to make sure we set up the environment to make sure that person's as independent in pos as possible in being able to make those choices, join the family meals and feed themselves. So the purpose of the mealtime might be purely to build skill. We might be building cutlery skill. We might be building the skill to be able to keep that food on the spoon to bring it all the way to their mouth. We might be building skill around food textures, around food temperatures and the types of food that this client might be eating, introducing new foods. Um, so the purpose of the meal might be around learning and teaching. And so for those meal times, we probably want more of an active posture for those clients. So they're a little bit more engaged, they're more upright, if not leaning forward. But that is really tiring to be able to maintain that position for a long time. Or it means they need something to prop on so we might look at what sort of trays we might use or how that chair and table fit together. Do we need a cutout to be able to support that client to be able to learn at that meal time? So we need to consider the purpose of the meal. And across the day, different meals might have different purposes. So your breakfast meal might be all about nutrition. Let's get enough food into them. So we might look at different seating for that meal as opposed to maybe afternoon tea is the meal where we're going to do a little bit more learning because the carer has a bit more time around that, that, that part of the day. So knowing the purpose of the meal times is really important and knowing what's important to the client and the family. So that's just a bit of a broad overview of what our disciplines might bring to some of these goals and we'll go into a little bit more detail. But first I'll hand over to Margaret to talk about the literature and what evidence we, we have. So, um, good afternoon everyone. When developing this presentation we attempted to to do a comprehensive search into the literature available on dysphagia and positioning. We also talked with our speech pathology, physiotherapy and occupational therapy colleagues. What we found from investigating the research was that there was little input from the disciplines of physiotherapy and occupational therapy into positioning and dysphagia. There was research into dysphagia by speech pathologists. However, the emphasis for this research has been on the effects of postural change of the head and neck in relation to dysphagia. There's been very little research on how various postures other than sitting up can influence dysphagia. There, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry everyone. It's better? Okay. Um, there has also been very little research into the combination of head and neck posture and body position in relation to patients with dysphagia. There was one paper by Kagaya, which in did include head and neck position with trunk positioning. There was discussion on head rotation for partial paralysis, combined with side lying for patients with unilateral paralysis, and for patients with severe dysphagia, a position referred to often was, that was used was the reclining position in which the head is raised 30 degrees. The paper stated that the reclining position makes it easy for the neck to extend, so a pillow must be used to inflect the neck. This information may not be applicable to all clients, and the last point was only targeted at persons with severe dysphagia. Kagaya also further discussed positioning in cases of unilateral paralysis, guiding the food bolus to the non-paralyzed side by turning the head towards the paralyzed side and side lying, um, leaning towards the non-paralyzed side with the chin down. Head rotation can be used when there is partial paralysis as it is easier for the food bolus to pass down the non-rotated side. Tilting the body to the non-paralyzed side or side lying makes it easier for the force of gravity to bring the food bolus downward and pass through the non-paralyzed side. Basically, it's important for positioning to be based on an individual assessment. So. There has not been um, a research focus on persons with uh, intellectual and physical disability. The literature search located papers concerned with swallowing and body positions for healthy adults and for persons with neurological impairment, especially strokes. But there was only one paper found that dealt with neck stability and varying, varying angles of inclination. This study focused on children with cerebral palsy aged three to six years. There was a study on healthy adults by Kelly. It looked at coordination of breathing and swallowing in the vertical and horizontal positions. The findings were that coordination of breathing and swallowing differed marginally between horizontal and vertical positions. Another study by Sakuna looked at 
relationship between swallowing and deglutition related muscle activity in various postures. In this study of healthy adults, 19 to 28 years, there was no statistical difference in body position on swallowing at 0 degrees, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, 120 degrees from horizontal. The study suggests that the optimal posture for deglutition is different among individuals. The reclining posture is recommended in rehabilitation because gravity pulls the food towards the posterior wall of the pharynx and away from the larynx, reducing the possibility of laryngeal penetration and aspiration. In yet another study by Nakayama, there's reference to several studies that have shown a decreased risk of aspiration in a reclining posture during deglutition compared with an upright posture in patients with neurological dysfunction, cerebral palsy and oral cancer. A reclining posture is favourable for leading the bolus through the pharyngeal posterior wall to the piriform sinus, but not the larynx. Having said all this, on the other hand, we also need to consider that sitting more upright at 60 to 90 degrees does increase patient alertness and may reduce reflux. So finally, the last theme that emerged through the research and the literature was that there was inconsistency in the terminology in relation to head and neck position. There was poor agreement about the meaning of certain head and neck postures. Clinicians had various understanding of the same posture, and in some cases, a single term represented more than two postures. According to Okada, a precise definition is important because various postures may have differing physiologic effects. Lee Jaho quoted Okada and stated, clinicians have various understandings of the same posture and that a single term represented more than two postures. So in conclusion, the outcome of the research themes can be summed up by Kagaya. There is no body position or training method that is equally effective for every patient. In other words, there's no blanket rule that can be applied to any patient or person with any particular problem. Individual assessment is essential to determine the best solution for that person in a particular environment. Okay, so now we will come to the results of our little activity. So, as mentioned earlier, thank you, um, the literature search showed that there is inconsistency in terminology in relation to head and neck positions. We have also, in our discussions with our colleagues, our speech pathology colleagues and our colleagues of other disciplines, have found that the same is true in our own workplaces. We were curious to find out what you think chin tuck and chin down are. This is why we asked you to circle the photo you believe was chin tuck. We're not trying to get a consensus on the definition, but rather demonstrating that there is a variation in all of our answers. These discrepancies highlight how important photos are in your mealtime management plans when talking about head and neck position. Photos of how you would like the person positioned both from the front and the side can encourage consistency and eliminate the confusion. Having a common understanding between OTs, physios and speech pathologists input into that section of the mealtime management plan is very important and really useful. And the results are 67 people circled photo 1, 7 people circled photo 2, no one circled photo 3, and 14 people circled photo 14, so photo 4. Well, either way, the, the point is we don't... We, <laughs> wait, can we move this slide over? <laughs> that there's no consistency, I guess, that, that we, we need to make sure that what we're talking about is appropriate for that client and that us as the therapists have the same language about mm. that, that particular client. That's, that's exactly right. And yesterday at a physio meeting, I actually asked the physios, I showed them this sheet, and I asked them to circle their choice around chin tuck, and they all chose photo two. They all chose photo two. So um, there was one newer graduate who um, was a little bit uncertain, but also included photo two. And um, yes, yeah, so because we see that as retraction. So that again highlights the real importance 
of photographing what your what your intended position is and communicating to the to the people you're working with around what you feel is the ideal position for that person. So it's about the communication and working together in the collaboration.